Our next speaker is Lisbeth Wienhof from the University Medical Center Groningen. Great, thank thanks you. Thanks for coming here. A big thanks for the organizers for uh, what has been a really exciting meeting also for me. And thank you all for your interest. Uh, it's not visible in yours. Good, so uh, I'm going to talk about the role of the nuclear pore complex in aging. Um, and I'll uh, introduce Uh, the complex to you. So nuclear pore complexes or NPCs are the sole gate to the nucleus in all eukaryotes from yeast to human. They are embedded in this nuclear envelope double membrane and they are massive. They are one of the largest molecular machines in cells. They span a width of uh, 100 nanometers and they're 50 megadaltons in size composed of 500 proteins. And uh, their most uh, well-known function is transport. They, they regulate uh, transcriptional regulators that go into the nucleus, RNAs out, involved in ribosome uh, synthesis. But they're also an organizational hub. Uh, the proteasome is anchored on the inside of the inner nuclear membrane to the nuclear pores. And they have important roles in transcription regulation, but also in genome stability, for example, eroded telomeres anchored to the pore, or repetitive DNA sequences. So the pore is uh, interesting from a biological, from a cell biology perspective and very central function, but biochemically is also very interesting. Uh, and, uh, and that is particularly because for its transport, which occurs through the central channel, um, yes. This we call the central channel here. This is where transport occurs. Mm, I'm messing up things with the slides. Here we go. Uh, transport occurs through the central channel here, uh, or also the membrane proteins go like this. But the interesting aspect is that this central channel is composed, down is forward, up is backwards. The central channel is composed of intrinsically disordered proteins. Uh, this means they are proteins that hold, have a persistent structure, not alpha solenoids, not beta sheets, not... Uh, they are completely dynamic, as you see in this molecular dynamic simulation, and that is uh, important for their function. And so the question is, what happens to nuclear pores in aging? And uh, as a biochemist looking at this complex, you can already uh, understand that making a complex of 500 proteins in this double membrane will be a process that is difficult. And so assembly may go wrong occasionally, and you wonder if that's a problem in aging. And then these intrinsic disorder proteins are known to readily aggregate. And so the question is, may, they, may there be problems in aging with aggregation of these intrinsic disorder proteins? And the first evidence that pores are actually impacted in aging came from Martin Hetzer a while back. Uh, Max D'Angelo showed in worms that in post-mitotic cells, uh, they are actually damaged in time. And the reason is that many of the components of the pore are very, very long-lived. They are hardly turned over. So they run a risk of accumulating, for example, uh, oxidative damage. So uh, I'll show you what we found in terms of these other two things. So aggregation of the disordered proteins and assembly in aging. So the first question, do we indeed see problems with making new pores in aging cells? Uh, and uh, we studied this using Baker's yeast, and we already saw a chronological aging of Baker's yeast as a model for aging. We use replicative aging. So uh, well-fed cells that are dividing. An individual cell can divide some 20 times in, or 25 times and then it dies. And, uh, and many of the molecular changes inside a cell uh, mimic those that uh, also occur in aging of uh, more complex organisms. And if you've been able to follow the cell that's now lived in this uh, microfluidic chip, you've seen it's done many divisions, it's grown, and uh, very soon it will die, it will be a small implosion, and that's the end of the lifespan. And if you look uh, at proteomes and transcriptomes of aging yeast cells under these uh, well-controlled uh, conditions, 
uh, you actually see um, that uh, there is a drift of the proteome and the transcriptome, and uh, particularly prominent is that there is a loss of protein complex stoichiometry. So basically, many proteins work in complexes, and if one subunit gets a little bit too much in aging and another too little, you get loss of stoichiometry, you get the risk of forming misfunctional, incomplete complexes and spar parts. And indeed, um, uh, that is, occurs in, in aging yeast cells, also in other aging systems. Uh, the phenotype is stronger in the, on the proteome level than in the transcriptome, so partly it's a post-transcriptional problem. And if you then zoom in, what are the complexes that are particularly sensitive to this proteomic drift, which become very uh, substoichiometric, then the pore is actually one of those that are, uh, you know, becoming very uh, substoichiometric with age. And if you look at the uh, composition of nuclear pores in these data sets, then you see indeed on the transcriptome level over age here, the levels are quite stable, but on the proteome level, they are vastly different. So, and it's particularly these green lines, these are the proteins that are declining in abundance in old cells. And what are they? Those are these disordered uh, proteins. And so, not having the right amount of uh, the components of the complex uh, uh, leads to forming malformed por uh, pores, leads to effects on transport, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and I'll show you just these two data. So here, in using these microfluidic chips, we can follow the individual cells and see uh, signs of misassembly, and we use CHIMP7. In humans, it's called CHIMP7 as a marker for these misassembled pores, and you see that they vastly increase uh, uh, as the cells age. And here we uh, tag uh, one of the uh, uh, exchange factors that is involved in nuclear transport. And these are individual cell trajectories, so individual cells aging, and you see that most of the cells uh, uh, have a, a large change in the localization of this uh, transport factor. So the answer is yes, we clearly see examples of misassembled pores appearing in old yeast cells. We do not know yet whether that's conserved in replicative aging uh, human cells, such as stem cells, but that would be interesting to look at. And if I grab this together with the earlier work from Martin Hetzer in worms, then it, it seems that in post-mitotic systems, a major problem is maintaining the system because they have such a slow turnover. Whereas in uh, mitotic systems like replicative aging yeast cells that need 100 new pores every two hours, uh, pore assembly is a main problem. So then uh, the, the core of my talk is about these disordered proteins that we've become very interested in and that we know decrease at least in replicative aging yeast cells. So these are the dynamic proteins that make up the barrier, basically the business end of the pore. And as you know, they decline. So if you purify any of these uh, disordered proteins, and they're called FGNOPs, and you put them under the microscope, they spontaneously form these little droplets through a process that is called phase separation. This is intrinsic in their amino acid sequence. This is what they spontaneously do. They come together, form little droplets. These are not aggregates. They can easily be dissolved again. And it's, it's a process a bit similar to oil fat molecules finding each other into droplets into water. And so these droplets can have different properties. They can be very dynamic, then we call them liquid-like, or they can be a little less dynamic, then we call them more like a gel. But these droplets can also progress into amyloids, big fibers. And I have to say, this behavior of liquid-liquid phase separation of FGNOPs was already observed by Dirk Gerlich in 2006. So in the field, we've been thinking about this for a long time already. And, uh, and the question is, of course, if these proteins do this so spontaneously, and they do it at concentrations way lower than they are in the pore, then in young cells, what prevents this from happening? Because this is not what we see inside the pores, it's uh, somewhere in between here. And so, uh, um, this really, the aging research made us realize we have to look for the proteins that actually regulate these phase state transitions, because apparently in young cells, this is well regulated, in old cells, it goes wrong. And we found so far two. The first uh, is called DNA JB6, it's a classical 
HSP40 chaperon, a protein that is able to reverse these equilibria. And then SP1, uh, and this is an FGNAP itself, and this we found in yeast and in humans, NSP1 is called NAP62. To introduce uh, very briefly DNA JB6, so it's an HSP40 chaperon. Uh, it was studied uh, because of its role in preventing aggregation of poly-Q and E-beta peptides. And it's been implicated in uh, Huntington and Parkinson and limb girdle disease. And the HSP70s uh, are known to help proteins maintain a stable folding, which is not what they do here, with help of, uh, uh, of uh, HEP. So DNA JB6, uh, and this was work done by Els Kuiper. She observed that it localizes to the nuclear envelope and was very uh, interested by that. What is it doing that? That was unknown. And we followed up uh, this idea it would have to do something with the pore. And she showed, first of all, if you knock it out, you see these cytosolic inclusions in pink of uh, nuclear pore complex components that get mislocalized. And they're actually annulate lamella, structures that we know uh, to exist natively as well. And uh, if you induce problems in misassembly, then you actually see, and this is uh, cryo-EM, uh, that the DNA JB6 co-localizes in these herniations, which form when pores misassemble. So this is part of the cell biology data that shows DNA JB6 is implicated in making new pores. And the biochemical data to show the DNA B6 actually is this phase state uh, regulator came from my lab. We purified it. And if you take uh, an FG NAP, and here we took uh, NAP 100 from yeast, it doesn't matter. In time, you see that, it's, uh, that it forms uh, aggregates that you can trap on a filter. But if you have Together with these FGNOPs, the DNA JB6, you see you can really slow down this formation of these types of aggregates, and here's a quantification. DNA JB6 also can alter these equilibria, and that's shown by very simple spin assays. So if you spin down uh, a sample with all four species, obviously you'll spin down these three and you'll know how much is soluble. If you do that same experiment in the presence of an alcohol, that is able to solubilize this species, you can see what's the equilibrium between these two. And indeed also here, DNA JB6 uh, really delays the formation of both these liquid and also these 1,6 hexandile insoluble particles. So for the second protein, the FGNAP itself from yeast, I just wanted to show you the imaging-based assays that we now do. So here we have again a, a purified FGNAP alone and together in this case with NSP1. And you can see that the particles really look different. They're more diffuse and, uh, and they're biochemically tested more liquid-like. And we can Im analyze these images uh, using a plug-in. Simulations by my collaborator, Patrick Onk, then allow us to give some insight into what is, you know, how does DNA, JB, how does DNA JB6, but also NSP1 interact with these FGNOPs to to actually elicit these changes in the equilibria. And this is just a snapshot of such a uh, simulation. So all in all, these two proteins are involved in making, in surveilling the FGNOPs for making new pores. But the surprise to us came from a very simple experiment where we said, what if we take young cells and we reduce the amount of NSP1? And this is the... Uh, NSP1 here going down in aging. And so we basically reduced it to sort of mid-aged cells. And we were wondering, you know, do we then see all these phenotypes that we see in aging related to the nuclear pore complex? And, uh, and because uh, this protein NSP1 is localized in the nuclear pore complex, as you see here in the ring, it also has a cytosolic pool. We created uh, this reduction in NSP in two different ways. One is just taking out one of the two copies. And in the other one, we left one copy untouched, but the other copy, we just we took out the, the domain that anchors it to the pore. So this protein is still fine localized to the cytosol, just not at the nuclear pore. And so then we did our transport assays, and we looked at uh, whether the pores are fine. And the answer is indeed that uh, you know, these mimic mid-aged cells, but the surprise whether these ones don't. And, and so apparently, and that, that is 
maybe that was not a surprise because if NSP1 has a chaperone function, it would do it in the cytosol, and indeed that's uh, secured in this strain. But the surprise was when we looked beyond phenotypes related to the nuclear pore. And here I'm showing you chaperones. So in aging yeast cells, chaperones are upregulated because of problems in protein homeostasis. In our strain that misses one of the two copies of NSP1, a similar upregulation and a similar pattern of upregulation of chaperones is seen in proteome data. And interestingly, if we just maintain this cytosolic pool of NSP1, uh, that doesn't happen. And so that suggests that cytosolic pool of NSP1 is, is, is helping protein homeostasis beyond the nuclear pore complex. And uh, indeed, if we express a luciferase form that normally is soluble in wild lab cells, but for example, aggregates when you submit the yeast cells to heat stress, this uh, luciferase, so it's, an, it's, a, it's a marker for the protein homeostatic capacity of the cell. In, uh, uh, in the knockout cell, you, so in wild lab cells, you hardly see aggregates you take out half of the NSP1, you actually see uh, uh, many fewer cells without aggregates and more with aggregates. But just maintaining the cytosolic pool of NSP1 actually alleviates this phenotype. And last, so this all suggests that the cytosolic NSP1 has a sort of a surveillance function beyond the nuclear pore complex. And then uh, maybe this is the very best experiment here. We uh, express poly-PR. This is a toxic protein that's found in ALS patients. Seen on our 72 ALS patients. It localizes to the nucleolus in different species, also in yeast. And it's very toxic, uh, also in different species and in yeast. But if we co-overexpress this cytosolic form of NSP1, then this toxicity is, uh, is, uh, is alleviated. So normally uh, the viability really drops quickly in 25 hours and in the presence of NSP1 it doesn't. And it's associated with the relocalization of, of the poly-PR out of the nucleolus. And this has been observed also in other systems that the toxicity comes from it being in the nucleolus. So that brings me to the conclusion. So uh, should we be worried about aggregation of FGNOPs in aging yeast cells? Yes. And we found these two proteins that are actually able to surveil the FGNOPs and, uh, and, and, and extend this surveillance function, at least in the context of NSP1, uh, to more general protein homeostasis, it seems. Um, and I'll just uh, zoom out. So the idea is that uh, these two surveillance factors uh, uh, chaperone FGNOPs after they're synthesized at the ribosome in the time period until they are incorporated into the pore. So if that all goes well, you build uh, happy new pores every two hours. But if it doesn't go well, you get these misassembled pores and, you, and it's associated with loss of protein homeostasis. Now the interesting uh, emerging picture that comes from this is that um, there is a, or at least the, the, the thing we want to research in the coming years is whether there is a set of surveillance factors that we do not yet know about that in young cells are there to surveil these intrinsic disorder proteins, not just the FGNOPs, but many of the others that are in the cell. Humans have 30% of the proteins have intrinsic disorder proteins. And, uh, and, and we find it particularly interesting that this chaperone, which has been studied very well in the context of neurodegeneration, is now suddenly having a role in nuclear pore complex uh, biogenesis, acting on these native intrinsic disorder proteins. In this context, it acts on these disease-related proteins like PolyQ and, and Huntington. And vice versa, this NSP1 component of the pore actually seeming to alleviate toxicity of poly-PR, a toxic IDP here. And I just want to acknowledge that this work resonates or is built on earlier work uh, that shows uh, in 2018 there was uh, three papers coming out showing that nuclear transport receptors that I didn't talk about also have a surveillance function on disease-related proteins. So it's another crossover between these fields. And I also have to say that the whole connection between nuclear de degeneration nuclear transport and neurodegeneration actually was spearheaded by these three papers that came out in 2015 showing based on genetic screens this uh, connection. So with that, I would like to thank uh, the people who did the work and I have to emphasize Els Kuiper who did all the ALS uh, work 
uh, in the lab of Harm Kampenga and Steven Berg, again, my collaborator, Patrick Ong, and these are the people from the lab whose work I specifically talked about, and the funding agencies and the many other collaborators. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, we have time for one question. Um, yeah. First of all, a fantastic piece of work. I really enjoy listening to you, although I'm sure I lost uh, many of the details. So if I understand your theory is that there is a, a problem in the assembling on the nuclear pore, and so that's why you find that uh, there is discrepancy between the transcriptomic and the proteomic. There are some proteins there that are not assembled properly, and so the stoichiometric proportion are not good. But how do you know that it's a problem of assembling and it's not a problem of chaperone-mediated autophagy that allow the protein to be, you know, substantially recycled, and so they stay there, although they are degraded. Uh, yeah, and, and maybe you said that, but I, didn't, I did not say it. No, no, I didn't say it, and, uh, and, and, and you're right. So, uh, we, so the reason why you think it's mostly a problem of assembly is because we have evidence for that. So there is, uh, we really see these misassembled pore, uh, pores uh, appear when the cells age. Um, uh, whether there is a, a change in, in the rate of degradation uh, of the different components of the pore, we haven't looked at in detail. But I think what's, you know, taking together this sort of more generic role of the shared uh, surveillance of IDPs, I think what's happening is that many of these FGNOPs that we lose in aging, they actually, uh, and especially NSP1, uh, they engage with, uh, with other intrinsic disorder proteins, nothing to do with the pore, that start to aggregate in aging. And for example, the, use, the human homolog of NSP1, NOP62, is found in, uh, in, 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 in foci that you see in, uh, forming from FUS or from FTD, I forgot which one. So, you know, these, these intrinsic disorder proteins have a tendency to hang out together. So if one is forming, uh, uh, aberrant phase states, it, it recruits other things in there. So that, that, that's my hypothesis, yeah. Great. All right, thanks. Yeah, thanks so much.